Hello and welcome to our notes section for Ancient Egypt. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just get started here, but I would like to make a note that I'm going to limit the amount of time I spend talking about uh, Egyptian gods and Egyptian mythology with this presentation as I'm going to upload a second presentation that will cover much of that material. Uh, so I don't want to hog up too much of uh, the, the historical aspect with talking about their culture and religion, because some of that is going to be coming uh, up next. So, without further ado. Starting with Egypt's geography. Uh, Egypt is located in northeastern Africa, as the map above uh, in the upper left shows you. Um, and Egypt is often regarded as the gift of the Nile. Uh, so if you think about Egypt as a country, it and the peoples that live there would not be able to exist without the Nile River. The Nile is the life source of Egypt, um, the beating heart of Egyptian civilization, Egyptian life, both in ancient times and in modern. Um, the Nile flows uh, kind of backwards of what you might think, so it actually flows from south to north. And when you look at a map, it's difficult to understand why that might be. Um, but if you think about it geographically, the southern part of what we would call Egypt uh, is very mountainous, right? You have that the Ethiopian plateau and the highlands there, which is where the Nile River originates, and then it flows downhill into the Nile River Delta out into the Mediterranean Sea. As the river flows, uh, there are some small rapids along the way. They're known as cataracts, um, and so those um, made life a little bit difficult for ancient Egyptians. Uh, there were times they would have to move uh, to shore to get around those or find ways to navigate around them. But by and large, the Nile River uh, was both the agricultural source and the, the sort of travel source for ancient Egyptians. Uh, so it's kind of an ancient highway, as many rivers were. Um, transporting goods and people by boat uh, was definitely much easier than trying to uh, transport by land. And since most civilizations nestled up next to rivers and a lot of the cities are located along rivers, it was an ideal source. Um, the other thing that's worth mentioning with, uh, with that sort of river travel is the Egyptians would know when their river floods, especially the Nile. So the Nile floods very regularly, um, kind of almost seasonally. And as it floods, it's depositing a lot of that rich soil from the highlands, from the mountains, to the Egyptian plains, especially um, up here in this northern region, this, um, this fertile delta, as we call it. So this uh, triangular-shaped piece of land at the mouth of the river. It's called a delta because it's that, that triangular shape, right? And so that triangular shape uh, is what the, the Egyptians um, uh, what would have eventually called a delta based on the Greek word delta, um, which is represented by a triangle. So if you think about Greeks uh, who would be sailing in um, from this direction, right, they're going to see this fertile green land as an actual triangle to them, hence the term delta. So uh, down here in the bottom, you can see uh, a temple right off of the, uh, the coast of the, the Nile River. That's a temple to the god Sobek. Uh, which is the crocodile-headed god, uh, and we'll, we'll visit uh, a discussion about that. Now, Egypt itself, if you take a look at the map up here, is actually divided uh, into two parts. So you have Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. Now, I've seen this division line in just about 100 different places, but um, it, it's typically, in, in my experience, um, you tend to see it somewhere right in here dividing Upper and Lower Egypt. So again, if you're thinking about how that river flows, down here in the southern portion is Upper Egypt, right? Because as far as geography goes, uh, it would be the higher portion. And then here near the Nile Delta is Lower Egypt. You're going to have to excuse my, my drawing skills with a the mouse. They're not on point. So it gets us through the basic geography uh, and the, the need for the Nile River. Okay, so uh, we're going to start off talking about the Old Kingdom, which is one of three main periods of Egyptian history that we're going to discuss. Uh, we're also going to talk briefly about the periods in between, what are known as intermediate periods, and we'll actually talk about some of the later Egyptian history as well. 
Um, so if you think of Egypt uh, as a country, most of the people living in Egypt lived around the Nile River. It was something they actually called Kemhet, which means black land. So if you think about the Nile River as flooding, depositing that fertile silt, would have made the soil or land uh, this dark, rich color. Right? If you've if you've ever done any gardening or or seen any uh, anything like that, uh, the the soil that's very nutrient rich tends to be very dark. Um, so black land, and then land uh, beyond theirs, what they call Desheret. Uh, or, or the desert or red land uh, was land that people didn't live in, right? It was barren, uh, didn't have any nutrients in the soil. We're going to throw in an Egyptian word here and there as we go as well. So <clears throat> you have Menes or Narmer, who is the first king uh, to unite Upper and Lower Egypt together. So before this, um, Egypt operated in small city-states or small kingdoms uh, prior to 2700 B.C. Uh, so that's what we would call pre-dynastic Egypt. Menes starts dynastic Egypt with the Old Kingdom. So he unites upper and lower kingdoms of Egypt together. Um, some of this would have been through, uh, through alliances. Others would have been through warfare that these different kingdoms are kind of brought together or brought under one rule. But Menes brings them together. He creates the capital in lower Egypt, known as Memphis. Um, not the Memphis in Tennessee. We just stole the name, right? So this is Memphis, Egypt, uh, in or, or the city of kings, as it's sometimes called in Lower uh, Egypt. And we often call this the age of the pyramids because this is when you start to see a lot of the things that we we tend to associate with ancient Egypt um, are actually created mostly during the Old Kingdom. Like if we were to draw out a timeline, a lot of people know about some Egyptian pharaohs. They know about Cleopatra. Typically, Cleopatra is closer on a timeline to the invention of the iPhone than she is the construction of the pyramids. So Egypt is a very long, extensive period of history. Um, so some of these things, you know, it, it doesn't change or vary a whole lot um, culturally, but um, definitely timeline-wise, some of these things happened quite a long time ago. So the Egyptian people viewed their ruler, their king, uh, their pharaoh, as both the political and religious leader. Now, they wouldn't have thought of it in so many terms, but that the, the pharaoh is a god uh, in, in every sense of the word. A god here present on earth, um, and that was who was leading them. So they worshipped the pharaoh just as much as they followed the pharaoh's rule. Now, this government type is something we call a theocracy. Right, so a theocracy, if we were to break that word down a little bit, theokratia. Right? So theo means gods or religion, uh, it's often referred to, and krasi or kratia is power, so power lies in the hands of the religion, so religious rulers. Um, although we don't have a lot of theocracies in existence today, um, some of the Middle Eastern countries are technically theocracies. And uh, Vatican City, the smallest country in the world, located within Rome, is, is a theocracy with their leader being the Pope. Okay, so we have the Egyptian social structure here before us. Now, um, you don't see slaves present here. Um, now, Egyptians did have slaves, uh, though... There's not an overwhelming number of them in the social structure because they're not really considered a part of society. Egyptians did not typically tend to enslave their own people. They enslaved people through conflict, so people that they captured. Um, so at the very top, you have the pharaoh. Below him are priests and nobles. Of course, priests are going to be high up because they're able to communicate with the gods, and then in so doing with the pharaoh. And then nobles, maybe other uh, upper class individuals. You have traders, artisans, shopkeepers, scribes, uh, the the kind of upper middle class. And then you have farmers and herders above the the, uh, the unskilled workers because the farmers uh, have the heavy responsibility of bearing the food for the land. Um, and then the unskilled workers, those who basically just performed labor jobs. Um, we're at the very bottom. So you can see some of the various tasks that each of those perform based on the pictures, but <clears throat> the unskilled workers are also going to be uh, part of the, the labor force that makes up that which constructs the ancient pyramids. Here's a, a modern photo 
of Giza, Egypt. Uh, you can see here the uh, the pyramids. There are, you know, there, there are, I believe there's seven uh, major pyramids that are often acknowledged. There's like the, the Bent Pyramid, the Step Pyramid, the Red Pyramid, uh, the, the Great Pyramid of Khufu, and then the Pyramid of Khafre. So uh, you can see several of these, this one being the Great Pyramid right here in the middle. Uh, and then, yes, this is the modern city of Giza behind it. Be quite the interesting backdrop you have. This is the Sphinx. Uh, you can see the Sphinx sits right next to the, the Great Pyramid. Uh, the Sphinx is important for a couple of different reasons. One, uh, we're not exactly sure who the Sphinx's face is, although it is uh, likely some, some pharaoh. Uh, the Sphinx is a mythical creature, of course, which is the body of a lion and the, the head of a human. Sometimes it has wings. Uh, it's not always the case. Uh, and they're typically a guardian of something. You know, we don't actually know exactly what always, um, but that's what they typically represent. Um, you know, this type of history evolves all the time. We had a conversation in one of my classes a few years ago when the video game Assassin's Creed Origin came out, which was set in Ptolemaic Egypt, but you get to visit these sites. Um, and the people creating that game actually helped discover a hidden room in one of the tombs because of how they were creating it to make it as historically accurate as possible. Scanning everything uh, actually led to the discovery of, of a, an extra room inside of a tomb, which I thought was pretty interesting. So these type of things develop all the time. So moving on to talk about the Old Kingdom a little more, <clears throat> you have these pyramids. Now pyramids uh, in ancient Egypt are, are tombs, right? These are tombs built for the, the pharaohs. Um, when the pharaohs die, uh, they're interred in these tombs uh, and they're built in a very particular way as to hopefully lead to the, the travel um, of those pharaohs to the afterlife or aid in their travel to the afterlife. So pharaohs, um, just like all Egyptians, uh, believed there was a very extensive process for reaching the afterlife. I know some of my classes saw the copy of the Papyrus of Ani that I have or the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Unfortunately, that's still at school. Uh, so I can't go through any of it with you today, but uh, there are some rituals that I'll discuss. Uh, maybe when I do the, the, the myth and religion section of this later, uh, that'll, that'll clarify some of that. Now, um, it's also during this old kingdom period of Egyptian history that uh, their form of writing is developed. It's called hieroglyphics. You can see over here on the, the upper left, uh, you have an example of hieroglyphics carved into stone, and that's hieroglyphics literally means sacred carvings, so it's often in stone. And if you look over to the left, this black stone panel that has what, what appears to be three separate forms of writing. I'll just kind of draw a quick line here to, to separate those. So uh, you have hieroglyphics on top, something known as demotic script, uh, which is like record-keeping script. And then at the bottom, you have ancient Greek. So this is how we can understand um, hieroglyphics. It's known as the Rosetta Stone because it was discovered in Rosetta, Egypt. Um, so it says the exact same thing three different times. It talks about one of the pharaohs. I think it's Amenhotep VII or, or something like that. Um, but, it, but it's talking about you know basically a press release, a, a victory that he had militarily as well as some other things. Now, it says the exact same thing in three different languages, and we know that because we could understand uh, sort of, I guess, language number two and language number three, uh, ancient Greek and Demotic script we understood, which allowed us to translate language number one, which helped us understand a lot dealing with Egyptian religion uh, and burial practices, as well as pharaonic records and, and a lot of that information. So it's very helpful. That's why the, the language learning program online is called Rosetta Stone. Right? It's the key to understanding the languages. So very briefly about <clears throat> Egyptian mummification afterlife. This is always fun to talk about because these pyramids that existed were for the purpose of aiding in the resurrection. 
of the the Egyptian pharaohs. Now, your average Egyptian would not be buried in some massive pyramid, uh, but they, if they were wealthy enough, they may have some type of tomb, or their family may have a tomb in which they're buried. Now, the practice of mummification is to preserve the dead, because your body is believed to be your vessel for the afterlife. So, your soul is going to be able to re-inhabit your body and take with it any material possessions you have. So it's why, um, for example, when we discovered the tomb of some Egyptian pharaohs, it's very exciting because there's lots of stuff there with them, lots of gold, of course, but there's other things as well, a lot of artifacts, things from their day, because they believed that they were going to be able to take all of this with them to their afterlife. Um, so the process of mummification is a whole ceremony, involves draining the blood from the body, uh, removing the organs and placing them in what you can see on the top left there, those little jars, the canopic jars. Um, the body is dried out using natron salts, um, and then it is stuffed and wrapped in linen cloth, um, like you typically see a mummy uh, wrapped in linen. And then they're placed inside of a tomb, and then inside of a vault, uh, in, or inside of a sarcophagus, uh, and then they're buried um, you know, in the tomb itself. Now, this is a very extensive process. Um, it doesn't happen in a day or two. And you can see it takes a whole team of people and there's priests involved. And this, is, this whole ceremony is believed to be presided over uh, by the Egyptian god Anubis, uh, which is the, um, the jackal-headed god. And jackals are seen uh, as significant Egyptian myth for, for protecting graveyards because they would often be seen in graveyards, jackals, uh, that is, so the, the god Anubis uh, is deemed to be the protector of the dead, um, as well as kind of a, a gatekeeper for the afterlife. Now, the old kingdom can't last forever, though it, it does last uh, the, the better part of 500 and some odd years, um, and it's going to end due to civil war. Basically, um, the, the pharaoh at the time had delegated enough of his rule, right, appointed parts of his kingdom to be ruled by others to the point that those governors felt that they had the right to make more decisions, uh, and so they fought back against the pharaoh, and that enters what we know as the, the first intermediate period, uh, where the, the pharaoh has to uh, eventually reassert power. All right, so that brings us to the Middle Kingdom, which lasts from 2050 B.C. to about 1700 B.C. So this is a, a good uh, 350 years. Um, but this takes place after that intermediate period, about 100 years of civil war and infighting that took place uh, in between where you have various rulers but no true pharaohs uh, in this way. You end up with this, this pharaoh named Mentuhotep who brings together Egypt after these civil wars, and he's able to reunite uh, the upper and lower Egyptian kingdoms and create what's known as Egypt's Golden Age. So anytime we use the term Golden Age, uh, we tend to be referring to an age of prosperity, right? when a country is at its, at its height technologically and with wealth. Now, Egypt, of course, is going to have more technology down the road, uh, arguably better technology, but they're not going to be more wealthy and successful at any given point as they were here. And a lot of this is because they have trade with their southern neighbors, uh, the Kush. So there was a kingdom to the south of Egypt uh, known as the Kingdom of Kush, and when they begin engaging in trade there, they can develop this trade for gold and ivory uh, and really help to enrich Egypt. You also see Mentehotep establishing public work projects. So part of this uh, is in the, the interest of you know, gaining more farmland, which is the, the draining of the soil, um, you know, removing some of the, the swamp land from the Nile River Delta area to allow more farming. The other is uh, in, in aid of trade. So this canal that's dug, uh, the Grand or Royal Canal, from the Nile River to the Red Sea. So you know, if you think of the Nile River's bend, digging across the land to reach the Red Sea, uh, several miles, but um, part of this is over land, part of it's through these canal systems. It allows for you to actually trade from the Red Sea uh, to, the, to the Nile River and back and forth, which is a huge, huge change, because you're not just relying on the Mediterranean and then over land trade, you can actually reach the Red Sea, which leads to, to the Indian Ocean as well. But the Middle Kingdom does not last forever either. 
Um, now it's this, this increase in trade and wealth is probably what made Egyptians a target. You had a group known as the Hyksos uh, or Hyksos from this region that we know as, as Canaan. So they, they come out of this Levantine region here, and I'm kind of outlining in red. And they invade through the Sinai Peninsula and into Egypt. Now they are far more technologically advanced than the, than the Egyptian people. They're nomadic. Um, they have advanced weapons such as using bronze material. Uh, the kopesh, which is this uh, sword you see in the upper left, and composite bows, so so shorter bows um, made up of different materials that allowed for them to be able to fight from chariot. So chariots are also added in this period. So if you think uh, about when we talked about um, the Assyrians with Mesopotamia, the chariot is a game changer as far as warfare goes. And so for them to be able to bring this to bear on the Egyptian people, uh, there would have been no chance. The, the technology difference and the weapon difference uh, would have made this, this um, conquest inevitable. And so the Egyptian people are going to be conquered by the Hyksos and will remain under their control for, for roughly 100 years um, before they are kind of liberated from the control of the Hyksos. So this brings us to the New Kingdom, uh, which is kind of the last part of um, major Egyptian history that we're going to discuss. So the New Kingdom um, really doesn't begin until about 1550 BC, and it's going to last to 1077 BC. Now this period of Egyptian history begins with this uprising. Now we're not exactly sure how this occurred, but the rule of the Hyksos is going to come to an end with Queen Ahotep of uh, the Egyptian kingdoms. So it's very likely that over this course of 100 or 150 years that the, the Egyptian people assimilated some of the technology. Uh, they're going to you know, spend some time around their rulers, these Hyksos. So they're going to you know, come into contact with this bronze and with the new weapons technology. And by borrowing and drawing on some of that, they're going to be able to turn it against the Egyptian or against the Hyksos invaders and liberate their country. So the new kingdom is something we call the age of the pharaohs, because this period is characterized by a lot of famous pharaohs, a lot of people that you've probably heard of before. So um, we'll get started on those guys and gals, I guess I should say. So uh, first one up is a Egyptian pharaoh by the name of Queen Hatshepsut. So she was a ruler who came to power as a regent, uh, which basically means that her young son, uh, her stepson, was too young to rule on his own when he comes to power. So his mother stood in as the regent. She was going to rule in his place until he came of age. Now, she actually proclaims herself as the pharaoh of Egypt before her son comes of age, which angered a lot of people, but she, she tended to... Um, actually stand in place as the pharaoh. She would dress in the pharaoh's clothes, wear the pharaonic beard, uh, kind of like this wooden beard, um, and refer to herself as, as a he, at least in royal conversation, because the pharaoh was the son of Ra. So she had to be the son of Ra to be the pharaoh. So she would uh, proclaim and, and act as a man when she was being the pharaoh, uh, but a lot of that was just characterized by the power she was wielding. So she's known often as the first female pharaoh of Egypt. Um, and then you can see her temple, uh, which is located at, uh, well, it's, it's near Karnak. It's uh, Deir al-Bahari. So it's still there today. Uh, it's a site of pilgrimage for a lot of people to go and see the temple that was constructed as the eventual resting place for Queen Hatshepsut. Now, the young stepson of hers... Uh, a guy by the name of Tutmose III, he creates Egypt's first empire as far as we're concerned. So he co-rules Egypt uh, with his, his stepmother slash aunt. Yes, you heard that correctly. Um, so he, he co-rules with her 
through much of his early days. And then when she dies, he goes through and tries to wipe the slate clean that she even existed, destroying statues, destroying temples, destroying imagery, carvings, everything he can find that has her name and face on it. He tries to wipe out. There's a lot of speculation as to why. Part of it's probably that he just wants to be known for what he did. Some of it may be something dealing with, you know, being ashamed or whatever. Um, but we know that a lot of that material was kind of defaced. Now, he goes and conquers much of the Middle East, uh, Palestine, Syria, and then south to the kingdom of Nubia. Now, we often call him the Napoleon of Egypt. Napoleon, of course, being the French emperor. Um, that must say took advantage of a lot of the technology, especially the chariots, um, to improve his armies and his army's technology and be able to expand outward. Next, we have uh, Pharaoh Amenhotep IV. Now, of course, these aren't perfectly in order. There's a lot of time we're covering here. We're skipping around, hitting the highlights. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of pharaohs, and you can see the list of kings. There's, there's plenty out there. Um, but we're focusing in on a few in particular. Now, Amenhotep IV is significant because he is the one that we use to talk about the change of religion within the Egyptian people. So Egyptian people are polytheistic, and they believe in many gods, and, and you're probably aware of some. We've talked about Anubis, the crocodile head Sobek. Um, there's Tawaret, which is the hippopotamus god of fertility, or goddess of fertility. There's Bastet, uh, Isis, Osiris, uh, Ra, um, you know, so Set, and, and, and all of these gods are, are fairly well known in one respect or another. We'll talk about some of them later. But that's polytheism, meaning they believe in many gods. This Amenhotep character believed in one god, the sun disk god, Aten. Uh, so he's monotheistic. He only believes that there is one god, uh, especially one god that deserves to be worshipped. So he actually changes his name from Amenhotep IV to Akhenaten, which means the spirit of Aten, this god. Now, um, he is married to Nefertiti, um, and he ends up having several children. Um, he has uh, his son, Tutankhamun, uh, who will eventually change his name to Tutankhamun. And, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's some speculation as to what happens here, because it's not all perfectly, um, perfectly preserved history. Uh, you end up with King Tut coming to power and restoring Egypt's um, mythical past, right? Their, their polytheism. Now, whether that happened under his rule or if it happened under Akhenaten's uh, near the end or somewhere in between, if priests took advantage, we're not exactly sure. But down the road, we have Ramses II. Uh, he is one of the longest ruling pharaohs. He's actually in power for almost 70 years, and he leads a military campaign to take back some of the land that was lost in the period in between. Uh, he wins a famous war against the Hittite people uh, at the Battle of Kadesh, which is there's a, a whole set of texts that's preserved with that. Um, and even though he's not mentioned by name in the biblical stories of the Exodus, it's often assumed that Ramses is the pharaoh of the Exodus, uh, and we'll get to that when we talk about the Hebrew people down the road. Now, there's a lot of uh, discussion as to why the Egyptian empire started to decline. Wars are expensive, you do have some weaker rulers in the later part of their history, and then there's the mystery, of course, of the Sea Peoples, uh, who are an invading people somewhere from most likely um, the upper Balkan Peninsula above Greece, uh, somewhere in this period. We know that they invaded uh, the Middle East and, and the Hittites and into Egypt because we have a lot of the communication between those rulers. Um, we know that they were talking about these invasions. We don't know exactly who they are, um, but eventually they definitely do uh, have an impact on Egyptian rule. Now, Egypt is going to be invaded by the Libyans, uh, who are going to take over in 950. 
Uh, and then Egypt is pretty much going to slowly fall to foreign control after that. Uh, you have this rule uh, by the Nubians from southern Egypt, and you can see the map up here. Um, so Nubia is mainly down here, this territory below the third cataract. Um, so you have, uh, or I should say rather above the third cataract, uh, Kerma, um, and then Moreau, of course, being one of their major cities. Nubia is known as the, the Kush kingdom. Um, and we also will associate it with Axum later down the road. The capital is at that city of Kerma. Um, and then the, the, the Libyans will be uh, overthrown and ruled by the Nubian leader, Pianchi. So you have Libyan rule to Nubian rule, uh, and then the Nubian power will move to Moreau to avoid a group known as the Assyrians. We talked about the Assyrians before. They are from Mesopotamia. Uh, they're a very warlike group of people, and they're going to invade uh, Lower and Upper Egypt and push the Nubians further to the south. Though the Assyrians won't remain there forever, uh, they'll be in some part controlled by Persians and then eventually driven out by Alexander the Great, the Macedonian Greek ruler, um, who becomes pharaoh of Egypt in 332. And pretty much there is where Egyptian history ends uh, and is taken over by Greek history. But for the, about the next 350, 360 years, Egypt is going to be ruled by Greeks. Uh, so Cleopatra the Seventh, who you see characterized down here in the bottom right, uh, she's often characterized or painted in different ways. Though it's important to remember that she would have been Greek, not Egyptian, uh, not Middle Eastern. Uh, she would have been from Greece, uh, a, a true Ptolemaic ruler. Um, and they they intermarried with brothers and sisters like the ancient Egyptians did. So that bloodline uh, would have been very Greek all the way to the end. Cleopatra uh, is the last pharaoh of Egypt. You're going to have rulers after her, but she's the last one to hold the title of pharaoh, uh, the true power of pharaoh, too. Um, and she is, upon her death, uh, going to basically turn, not by her will entirely, the uh, kingdom of Egypt over to the Romans um, in 30 BC. This timeline is uh, is a nice place to reference to because you can see the the pre-dynastic Egypt mixed with the early uh, dynastic and then the old, middle, and new kingdoms as Egypt hits kind of the higher parts of its power. And then you can see the slow decline out of the Libyan, late Persian or Assyrian, uh, the Greek and Roman periods of Egyptian history. Okay, so that brings us to our end of uh, really Egyptian history. Now, of course, there's a lot more to cover, and, and I'll talk about the, the myth a little bit um, in a later presentation or a later video. Um, please, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out uh, and look for more on this to follow. Thank you guys, and have a great day.